It has been a month of beautiful sunshine. It has been a month of wonderful snowfall and everything in between. Let it rain was what we were singing four or five days ago. And now some people are saying, when's it going to stop? <laughs> Aren't we funny people? When it's hot, we want to know how long until it's cold. When it's cold, how long until it's warm. When I'm hungry, how long till we eat. And when it, you know, if somebody's late, how long do I have to wait? And truly, that is exactly where we are at today. This month, the month of April, has been uh, the fourth month of 2014 that has brought to us four questions. That If we will settle these four questions once and for all, it can really allow us to move from where we are at in our relationship with God to a greater relationship with Him. Now, some people don't understand this concept of a relationship with God because they don't understand who God is. In week number one of this month, Brother Telly shared with us who Jesus is. The answer is He is the expression of God. He is God with us, Emmanuel. We see God in the face of Jesus. The disciples couldn't figure it out. One day Jesus said to them, when you, uh, show us, the disciples said rather, show us the Father. And Jesus said these words in John 6, uh, 14. He said, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. In other words, Jesus was saying, when you see me, that's all you need to see. And that blows people's minds when they realize that this omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent creator of all things would find himself robed in a body. You see, that's what John chapter 1 says. The Word was creating all things in the beginning. And the Word in John chapter 1 verse 14 became flesh. And there are some people who still are looking for a Messiah. They still have not embraced the reality that Jesus is the answer for the world today. They're still looking for somebody to come, somebody to do some miracles, somebody to resolve their life situation when all the time Jesus is standing there saying, I am here. Well, that can't be you. You're, you're just one of those guys that was born a long time ago in in the land of Israel, right? Well, that can't be you. 300 prophecies Jesus fulfilled, helping people understand and still helping us today understand who Jesus is. Jesus is not just a teacher. He's the world's best teacher, but he's more than that. Jesus is not just a miracle worker. He is the only miracle worker that can cure all things. Amen? He is not just a philosopher. He is the only philosopher that came to earth to share with us the plan to reconcile all mankind and bring hope where there's hopelessness. He's not just a welfare program. He is the welfare program. He not only feeds the hungry, but he has the ability to clothe the, clothe the naked. He has the ability to comfort the lonely. He has the ability to be all things that we need in this life. And he proved it in the four Gospels that he can do those things for us. So if you can settle the question, who is Jesus? That he is God in a body with us. You can move on. But until you settle the fact of who Jesus is, you'll constantly be searching for something else. The second question we answered was, what should I do with Jesus? This was the question Pilate asked. He knew Jesus was innocent. He knew that he didn't deserve the cross. He says to the people, what should I do with Jesus? And I want you to understand that if you can answer that question, you can move on in your relationship with Christ. But if you're still asking the question today, and there may be somebody here that's saying, I don't know what to do with Jesus. Number one, I don't know who he is. And number two, everybody I've seen who says they're a Christian, I don't want to be like. And I don't blame you. I've seen some people who profess the name of Jesus, and I'm like, man, if that's being a Christian, really? Really? And then I go back to the Bible and I start reading and I realize that if I look at others, I'll become confused. If I look at myself, I've even failed myself. Anybody here know what that's like? <laughs> I look at myself, I'll become discouraged. But if I keep my eyes on Jesus, that's, that's where the answer is. But it still doesn't answer the question, what are you going to do with him? 
If you can settle that question once and for all, what should I do with Jesus? You can move on in your relationship. Jesus, at one point in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, is standing at a door knocking. He says, if anyone will let, me, let him answer the door and come, let me come in, I'll come in and fellowship with him. I'll have a meal with him. What's he saying? He says, I'll let you know me. A lot of people don't know, to know what to do with that knocking on the door of their heart. They don't know what to do with that nagging guilt and shame. They don't know what to do when they come into the presence of God and they experience His love and, and they cry and they weep and they, they just don't know how to respond. And I'm here to tell you that you can answer that question. You don't have to walk out of here today. You don't have to live another week, another month, another minute. You can answer that question. I know what I have to do with Jesus. I open the door to my heart. I let Him in. That's, that's what that whole tongues and interpretation was about, was don't let the sins keep you from this relationship. But there's a lot of people that are scared because if Jesus comes in, he'll rearrange the furniture, right? Yeah, he kind of does that. <laughs> I think we all understand the fact that if we're going to call Jesus Lord, that gives him permission to be Lord, right? I mean, can you imagine, you, you husband and wives, can you imagine getting married and, and, uh, and saying, you know, we're married, but you're not really my spouse? Got your head on that one and try to figure it out? No, that's not what we do. When you get married, you commit yourself to serve and to be served by this person that you've committed yourself to. It's amazing what happens when we let Jesus be the Lord of our lives. Can I get an amen? amen. Can I get an amen for those of you who know what it means to have your furniture rearranged and his idea was better than your idea? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> what should I do with Jesus? I say let him in. Let him be God. Let him be the Lord of your life. Let him rearrange the furniture in your life. Last week, we talked about this whole next step, which was the cross, and it was the, the grave. And what is this whole concept of Easter season? It's about identifying who Jesus was. He was God with us, the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. It's about answering the question, what should we do with him? Let him in. It's about the third question, which was, where is he at now? You see, he's not in the manger. He's not in the, on the cross, and he's not in the tomb anymore. Matter of fact, remember that bunny that was here last week? He's gone too. But he died an eternal death. <laughs> you see, if I can play with this just for a little bit. He was empty on the inside. <laughs> that chocolate bunny, some of you don't know because you weren't here last week, but there was a chocolate bunny in the manger, and it didn't belong there, right? There was a chocolate bunny behind the cross. It didn't belong there, right? There was a chocolate bunny in here, and it didn't belong there either, right? Right. And Brother Tom did something so great last week. He said, I'm going to put this bunny back here because I know it won't leave. <laughs> and it didn't leave, but it did die. Because <laughs> it was hollow on the inside. And today we're going to talk a little bit about that. But, but we do need to ask the question, where is Jesus? You see, that bunny will never be filled because it doesn't have the ability to ask something in to its life. But you're not that chocolate bunny. You're not that kind of a creation. You're the kind of creation that has the ability to say, Lord, not only come into my life, but fill my life. I, want, I don't want you to just be my creator. That's who he is. He's your creator. But I don't want you to be just a creator. I want you to be my savior. And that's what he did when he came and he was in the manger. And, and then he went to the cross. He came to save us. But when they laid him in the tomb, he had something else in mind. And that was to fill your life to overflowing. Matter of fact, Jesus said in John chapter 7, he said, if any man believes on me, like the scriptures say. In other words, there's a, there's a certain way to believe on him. You can't just believe how you want to believe. You have to believe what the scriptures say of him. In other words, that he is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the Messiah. There is no other. If you believe on him like the scripture says, Jesus said, he that believeth on him, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Where is Jesus now? We saw that question last week when we said he has ascended up to a place of absolute power and authority. We answered the question when we, when we saw him knocking at the door. He is knocking at the door of men and women's hearts. Young ladies, young men, 
desiring to be filled with more than what this world has to offer. He stands there knocking. He says, I'll fill it up. Matter of fact, I'll fill it up so full that it will come out of you, a river of living water. And I love that verse because, you know, I've been around a lot of people who speak death. You ever been around anybody who just constantly speak in death? You say, well, no, I don't know anybody that goes around saying death, 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 death. How about you're ugly and your mama dresses you funny? That's not a life statement. That's a death statement. How about you're stupid? That's a death statement. How about you're ugly? That's a death statement. How about you can't do anything right? That's a death statement. How about I hate, I hate, I hate. How about these, all these negative things? You see, Jesus said we, his words were spirit and they were life. And we've got an opportunity to have life come out of us if we'll answer that question, where is Jesus now? He's in my heart to stay. He's put a song in there. He's filled me with his spirit. It's flowing out of me. And now when I bump into people, they get a little bit of life instead of a lot of death. When somebody crosses me, they get forgiveness rather than penalty of death. When somebody says something about me, I forgive them because sometimes they don't know what they're doing. That's life rather than convicting them and condemning them to hell. That's death. So those three questions are very important for us to understand. Who is Jesus? He is Emmanuel. He is Lord. Where, or what should we do with Jesus? Let him in. Let him be Lord. Where is Jesus now? He's in all authority and power and position of heaven, but he's also in my, in my heart. And that brings us to our fourth question. The fourth question is, when will Jesus return? You see, if you turn with me to Acts chapter 1, the disciples had to wait. And they had been waiting for some time. In Acts chapter 1, we find a passage of Scripture where they say, is it time yet? Are we there yet? They want to know what is next. They want to know how long they're going to have to wait. What are they waiting for? They're waiting for the rise of Israel, the rise of the kingdom of Israel to become that prominent world power that it had been in the past. In, in Revel, excuse me, Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, Being assembled together with them, he commanded them, this was Jesus, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? That was their way of asking, God, is it time yet? Is it time? Have we waited long enough? Are you now going to accomplish our hopes, our plans, our agenda, our thoughts about what you should do? This is after the resurrection. So they weren't looking to the manger. They were way past that. They weren't looking to the cross. They were way past that. They weren't even at the empty tomb anymore. They were way past that. They were wanting now for the promise of God to be accomplished. And Jesus says in these words, verse 7, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Let's read verse 8 together, shall we, out loud? But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The disciples were saying, hey, we want to know when this coming, when this arriving of Israel's future, glorious future is going to be. And Jesus simply responds, he says, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons. Now, in that is a part of the question that we are going to answer today. Because I am convinced that if you know who Jesus is, and if you have already let him into your life, and if you have already established the fact that he is the Lord of your life, and you, don't, you know where to find him, that you can find yourself stunted in your relationship with him if you are still wondering and challenged by the question, when will Jesus return? 
In Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, there's a passage, uh, a verse here that challenges us with a concept that I want to put to you today that I hope will help answer this question. When will Jesus come back? I will tell you that it will not satisfy some of you before we even get there. Some of you will still be frustrated, wondering why, how come, when, what, all these kind of things. We're going to get to that. But for those of you who have a short attention span, I wanted to get to the answer early so that you could have that chance to write it down. Matter of fact, if you look on your bulletin, there's a space there called God Thoughts, okay? This is a good spot to write down Galatians chapter 4, God Thoughts, about answering the question, when is Jesus going to return? Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 is a passage of Scripture that talks about Jesus' first coming. Would you read it out loud with me together? But when the fullness of time had come... God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. I want you to key on the phrase, on the word fullness and the fullness of time. The fullness of time means it is now time for this event to take place. There is no longer any need to wait any longer. Now, if Jesus' first coming was directed by God to happen in the fullness of time, Can anybody put two and two together and get the answer to when Jesus will return later? In the fullness, good. We have some people who got it, okay? Now, some of you are still like going, I'm not good at math. I don't know. I don't. This is not a math question. It really says this. If God does not change the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? If God did it this way then, guess what he's going to do the next time? The same way, right? So I want you to be able to answer the question because people will do crazy things. Dave Koresh, anybody remember him from Waco, Texas? He convinced people that it was time and it was time to rise up and it was time to do all that they did and it ended up costing people's lives, children's lives because he said it was the fullness of time. Denominations like Jehovah's Witness, have said over the years, this is the time. What are they saying? This is the fullness of time. The Mormon church, other churches around the world are guilty of setting dates and times throughout their history. It wasn't too long ago that somebody in California said, it's going to happen. Remember that? Wasn't it just about a year ago? May, about a year ago? This is it. What are they saying? This is the fullness of time. I want you to be able to live your life with a confidence, not a frustrated concern. I want you to be able to, Jesus wants you to be able to live your life with an absolute assurance that, you know what, when it's time, it's going to happen. And so understand that Jesus came in the fullness of time just exactly like it was supposed to happen, which leads me to conclude that the answer to the question, when will Jesus come back? is the fullness of time. Amen? You ready to take an offering and go home? You got got enough? I'm serious. We we really could. Because that's the answer to the question. When is Jesus coming back? When it's time. Matter of fact, if you notice this, in the, the reading we did in Acts, Jesus didn't even tell the disciples when they asked, is this the fullness of time? He says, no, it's not for you to know. Are you okay with that? Are you okay with not knowing? Remember when you were just a little kid and you would ask your parents, are we leaving yet? Are we leaving now? Are we leaving now? Are we going yet? Are we going yet? Remember? Or are we there yet? (laughs) We said it before and we said it in the middle of the trip. Are we there yet? We would constantly be there. Why? Because we wanted to get there. And I'm convinced that This is not an abnormal question, but I am convinced that some of you kids, some of you adults heard this. We'll get there when we get there. You ever hear that? And and was did you like that? (laughs) Did any of you like that reality that you know what? They're not gonna tell me. That's kind of what Jesus was saying. He says, Hey, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. In other words, it's gonna happen, but you don't need to know. Then there were other parents. 
who would say, we've got about 10 miles. Now, I heard this once, and I believe it's true, 30 minutes for youth in church is like a million years. <laughs> and maybe some of you are still in your youth because, anyway. But, but the point is, sometimes that mile marker didn't make sense to us because we couldn't comprehend that. We didn't want to know the mile markers left. We wanted to know when, the time. For those of you that are content with in the fullness of time, you, you truly are dismissed. If you, if you really are wanting to go, you can. I will dismiss you now. For those of you who may have wanted to know, are we on the right course? Are we headed the right direction? Jesus didn't just leave them hanging. Go with me to Matthew chapter 24. Some parents said 10 more miles, 20 more miles. Some parents said, we have to get to Shelley first before we get to Blackfoot. And so it gave you something to look at, right? You know, if, I were, if, 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 if God were to open up the opportunity for, for, for uh, people to go down, or myself and a couple other pastors to go down and visit with the prophet in, in, in Salt Lake City, and uh, he was open to receive the, the, the good news of Jesus Christ and be transformed. You know, if I were on the road with these pastors and we were going down the road and all of a sudden we got to Aberdeen, anybody know that we might be just off course a little bit? And then we hit American Falls. Anybody know that we're still off course a little bit? And then we hit Burley. We need to make a correction, don't we? We need to turn around and come back to that exit that says Pocatello 100 miles or Salt Lake City 100, 100 miles. You turn there, you go south, right? You got to get redirected. But if I were to get in that car with those pastors and say, guys, this is a great day. We are going to go to Salt Lake. God is going to open up the windows of heaven. We are going to see a great transformation and revival happen. What would happen if all of a sudden we, we hit Shelley? And then we hit Blackfoot. And then we hit Pocatello. And then we hit... Everybody would know. Yeah, you got the towns, okay? Everybody would know. Hey, we are on the right trail. I want you to look at Matthew 24. We're just going to kind of slip through this. I'm not going to go into great detail. I'm not trying to solve all your questions about the apocalypse or whatever has happened. But I do believe that Jesus was concerned enough for his disciples that he wanted them to have an answer for the question of when will he come back. So go with me to Matthew 24. In verse 24, verse 1, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to, sh uh, to show him the, temp the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, <clears throat> Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you that not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. If you are taking notes, that is mile marker number one. The disciples came out, and they looked at their temple and said, Isn't this great? Jesus looked at it and saw a little bit further down the road. He saw a time where this temple, as great as it may have been, was not going to be standing. And he said to them, you need to be aware of this. Verse 3. Now as he sat on the mountain of olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. I think this is a great way to start. Because ultimately when we are trying to find the answer to questions, we become gullible. We can be so excited to get the answer that somebody could convincingly give us the wrong answer and we'd believe it. Throw you back a couple years to a guy by the name of Jim Jones who convinced a whole bunch of people that the fullness of time had come. The disciples were wanting to know, when is this coming? And for those of you that are looking at me blankly, like, who in the world is Jim Jones? Go home, Google it, look it up. It's another one of those guys that Jesus is fixing to talk about. He said, be careful that no one deceives you. And I am so convinced that we have got to get that down. That as passionate as we are about Jesus coming back, that we do not fall into a trap of deception. Look what he says in verse 5. 
He gives some mile markers. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear the, of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. You know what Jesus just said in modern English? It's going to get bad before it gets better. This is bad, but it's going to get bad and even worse before it gets better. Notice here, if you will, that Jesus begins to give a checklist, kind of a mile marker to know, hey, we are headed the right direction. We are headed in a direction that we can be assured the king is coming and we're getting closer. We're one mile, we're one marker, we're one memorial closer than we were before. First of all, he talks about the deception that abounds. And folks, that is not new. It has not gone away. There is still deceivers in, in this day. There are deceivers who will parade themselves not only as an angel of light. They will parade themselves as a prophet. They will parade themselves as an evangelist. They will parade themselves as a good social motivator. They will parade themselves as a politician. They will parade themselves in a lot of different uniforms trying to get people to believe that they are the Messiah. They are the one who's going to change. They are the one who's going to make the difference in this world and as times get worse and worse and worse and people are looking for financial aid they're looking for social aid they're looking for all the kinds of aids that are out there and what is being brought to them is just a counterfeit if it's not jesus christ amen Amen. what we have to realize is the deception is followed by conflict yeah turn to your neighbor and say duh please duh Anytime you start lying, you're going to start having conflict, right? (laughs) How many of you started lying about who stole the cookie out of the cookie jar, and then you couldn't sleep that night because you knew you lied? Anybody besides me? Okay, some of you took three or four days before you started getting bothered, right? Or maybe you shoplifted something, or maybe you bought something uh, that you shouldn't have bought. The Lord told you not to bought, or your parents told you not. Anyway, it doesn't matter what it is. It matters the point that conflict often follows deception. It's going to happen. When Eve was deceived in the garden, her and her husband started having conflict. That's a good marriage tip for those of you that are married. You want conflict-free marriage? Don't lie. Keep it on. Thank you. I got a good amen. (laughs) That's good. That's good preaching right there. It is. If you don't want conflict, don't lie. Now, that doesn't mean it's always going to be easy, but it'll be easier than if you had lied. All right, we're back here. Jesus says, listen, there's going to be deception. Don't be deceived. Secondly, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be national conflict, nation against nation. There's going to be wars. That's that's conflict on a major scale, escalating scale. Do we have wars going on? Yes. Can we say that we are closer to the coming of the Lord than we were when this was spoken? Yes. Why? Because we're seeing some of these things fulfilled. And I'm convinced that over the years, every battle, every nation that went up against nation, Christians around the world would say, hey, this is one of the signs Jesus said, we have got to be ready because we don't know when he's coming, but we do know it's getting worse. It's not getting better. Verse 9, then they will deliver you to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended will betray you, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will draw cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. Now, wow, that's a whole bunch. And that's a whole bunch And we've just barely got started. What is Jesus saying? He says, listen, you want to know when I'm coming? You want to know when all this stuff is coming about? Let me tell you how to identify when it's coming. He says there's going to be conflict. He says there's going to be persecution. And then in that verse, um, 
excuse me real quick, verse 14. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. This was another one of the indicators. Hey, guess what? When the gospel is ultimately out to every nation, every tribe, every tongue, then the end will come. Are there still languages in our world today that don't have the gospel? Some of you don't know. Some of you do. There are still nations. Matter of fact, there are organizations like, uh, like the, the uh, Voice of the Martyrs that's constantly trying to help people who get persecuted for having a Bible. Take the Bible into other languages, other places. There's other groups, and my mind just went blank, for, but, but other groups are constantly focusing on, the, on reducing the number of, of uh, race, uh, the number of nations, the number of people groups that do not have God's word in their language. And I want you to know that that is what's motivating them to some degree. Hey, if we want to see the end finally arrive, let's do what we know God has told us in his word. And that let's keep reaching out. Let's keep getting the gospel out to people who don't know. Now, as great as that is, let me just inform you about something. With our intellectual society in America, would you believe that you could go on to some college campuses today and randomly select individuals off of college campuses and ask them to explain the virgin birth, and they would look at you as if they have never known the story at all. You could ask them, have you ever celebrated Christmas? They would say, oh yeah, we, all, we know about Christmas. Christmas is about that guy with the, the reindeer and the, the, the really bright nose, right? They don't know. And they speak English. You could ask people about the Easter season and they would tell you all about the other stuff that gets put in the grave. But the truth is, they could not tell you what the grave and the empty grave means. And they speak English. What's my point? As much as we want to see the gospel going to the ends of the earth, you've got to realize that you and I have a part in playing, in helping other people right here in our own country, know the good news of Jesus Christ. But here regardless, when is Jesus coming back? It's not going to happen until it has gone out entirely around the whole world. What does that mean? That means you have time to not give your life to the Lord yet because there's still some languages. You got time to just kind of play church if you want to because we're still reaching missions. No, that's not what that means. Because there's another end. You see, Jesus said here in verse 14, and then the end will come. Can I tell you that if you have heard the gospel and if you have embraced the gospel, the Lord may knock on your door tomorrow and the end will come? You see, once you've heard, you have no excuse. Once you've been given an opportunity to embrace this Jesus, you have no excuse anymore. And so once you have been presented with the gospel, your candidate, your end may come. My dad brought me up telling me that there was two comings of the Lord. One is going to happen for everybody, but there's that other one that's a personal knock on the door. When the Lord says, your appointed time is done. And I am convinced that not one soul, not one soul is going to stand before the throne of grace and be able to say, I never heard. And for those who have heard, he's got a plan for you. I told you it was going to get worse, and it, it does. Verse 15, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Let me just pause right here and say, I'm not going to do an exegesis on Daniel. I'm not going to tell you all the stuff. I'm just going to say you need to go read the book of Daniel and find out what he's talking about and realize that what was happening in that place is twofold. Number one, there was a Roman emperor one time who took a pig into the Holy of Holies in the temple that was in Jerusalem. That was considered to be the abomination of desolation. It was when he took that animal that was such a, uh, a mark 
mark of paganism, such a mark of, of, of sin and, 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 uh, and, and falsehood into the very presence of God and made a statue and made a show of himself that some people would look at that and say that was the abomination of desolation. That was the ultimate act of, de- uh, of desecration in the holy place. There are other people who say that may have been bad, but what we're going to see in the future is even going to be worse. There are some people right now who are putting together all of the things necessary for a priesthood lineage to walk into Jerusalem and have the garments ready and have the horns ready and have the instruments ready, have the altar ready, because all All they need is permission to build that temple up again. And they are coming together to build it up again. There are some people who would tell you Jesus won't come until that temple is built again. There are some people who will tell you that when that temple is built, this is going to be fulfilled. Somebody's going to walk into that temple and they are going to desecrate. They are going to absolutely uh, frustrate the grace of God. And there will be that point in time when it will happen. Now, I'll tell you, I have lived 49, 48 years And I have yet to see the temple built. Does that mean I can just relax and act like nothing's happening? Does that mean I can just go live my life and live a sin-filled life and not do what Jesus asked me to do or what I was created to do because because the temple hasn't been built yet? No, listen to me. When Jesus said, it is not for you to know the times and seasons, he did not give us an excuse to go off and be lazy-hearted Christians or to be lukewarm Christians or to be Christians in name and not in, in, in practice. He said, listen, I am coming, and when I come, I want to show you some things that are going to happen. But listen, you need to know there is something he has got for us to do. We'll get to that in a little bit. Verse 16, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is in the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation such as had not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Look at me real quick. That's a statement of grace. That's a statement of mercy, but it is also an absolute statement of judgment. God is saying it is going to get so bad that if he doesn't step in with mercy and grace and shorten the tribulation that is planned to come about, that there will be those, even Christians, will deny Christ and fail. But because he is merciful, because he is long-suffering, he says, I'm going to cut some of this stuff short. Why? Because he doesn't want to see you fail. You need to hear that. God does not want to see you fail. He does not want to see you miserable. He does not want to have you frustrated in this life. He came to give us life and that more abundantly. He came to give us joy unspeakable and full of glory. And if you're not living that joy-filled life, you need to ask yourself, what Jesus are you following? What Jesus have you let in? Whose word are you believing? Verse 23. Then if anyone says to you, look here is the Christ or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets shit will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Jesus spoke in such a way that they could understand what to look for and what not to look for. They were not to look for people putting themselves up as I am the Christ, I am the Christ. They were not to run after this person over here or run after this group over here or go to this conference over here or go to there. there. They were supposed to focus on the Lordship of Jesus Christ and him alone. They found themselves in a situ- they would find themselves in a situation where they would be challenged at the very core of their life. Who am I going to believe Jesus is? And what am I going to do with him? Are you willing to speak and to live according to his name and his name alone? That is the challenge we have before us even today. And it was the challenge for the disciples back then. 
Interestingly enough, we have the second indication of when the Son of Man is coming back. First of all, when the gospel goes to the ends of the earth, he was coming back. The end will come. In this verse, he says, uh, in, excuse me, verse, uh, I'll get it, verse 27. He says, this is how it's going to happen. It's going to happen quick. It's going to happen like lightning goes from one end to the next end. Boom, it's going to happen just like that. In other words, you can't predict when lightning is going to strike. But you can be ready and prepared in situations where lightning is there. And Jesus is setting the stage, helping us realize that in this kind of environment, the Son of Man will come like lightning, and it will come quickly. When the gospel has gone to the, all the ends of the earth, every language, every tongue has been, then there will be a place and a time for us to be able to be ready. And if you have given your life to the Lord, you need to live with one eye looking to the skies, prepared to go in the twinkling of an eye, and the other eye busy about those things that he has called us to do until he comes. When will Jesus come back? Didn't always tell him when, but he told him how. He said it's going to happen quick. He goes into verse 29 through 31 and specifically says some things that are important for us to understand. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The sun, stars will fall from the heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the or heaven to the other. Oh, for those of us who know him, those are words that we, we, we love to hear. We know it's not going to be easy. We know it's not going to always be comfortable to do this Christian walk, to be like Jesus. But we know that in the fullness of time, there is going to be the sound of a trumpet. And for those who are alive and remain, we're going to be caught up to be with him. And that gives us the ability to settle the question, when is he coming back? That's irregardless. The fact is, I'm going to be ready when he comes back. You see, the question of when Jesus comes back is irrelevant. It's not for us to know. Matter of fact, if you go with me to verse 36, Jesus addresses this. He says in verse 36, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Remember Galatians 4.4? 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son. Guess who's sending the Son the second time? God's doing it. And when is he going to do it? In the fullness of time. I can give you mile marker after mile marker. I can tell you the temple's not standing. I can tell you there's persecution. I can tell you there's all kinds of things going. We are closer than we have ever been to the coming of the Lord. But for me to stand here and say he's coming back at 1205 on this day would be an absolute farce. And I expect every one of you to get up and leave. And if anybody comes to you and says, hey, I just got a word from God, Tuesday at midnight, God's coming, you need to walk away. But if somebody comes and says, hey, listen, you've heard the gospel. You've had a chance to embrace him. And he's coming in the twinkling of an eye. And he may come to get you tonight. Are you ready? You need to think seriously about when Jesus is coming back. And the question of when, when is secondary to the question of, are you ready? Should it be tonight? An evangelistic tool over the years has been that question, if you died tonight, where would you spend eternity? Listen. Jesus goes on to say, but as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. As in the days, for in the days of no, days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day of Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. There's more 
but some of you aren't ready for. But some of you need to hear what Jesus said. He said, listen, when the end comes, it won't come before everybody has had a chance to hear it. He said, when it does come, it's going to come like lightning. When it comes, he's going to gather up from the four winds, that basically means all over the world, those that have taken on his name. Those that have answered the question, who is Jesus? Those that have answered the question, what shall I do with Jesus? And those that know the, que- the answer to the question, where he is. He's coming back for them. He's coming back to take them out. He's coming back to draw them to himself and to set them in a place while the rest of the destruction and the ultimate elimination of this sin-filled world takes place. You see, the Bible says that the first time God destroyed the earth with the water, but the next time he's going to destroy the earth with sin. You say, well, what did the earth do? He's not destroying the earth because the earth did anything wrong. He's destroying the earth because fire purifies. He didn't flood the earth because the earth did something wrong. He flooded the earth because water purifies. And Jesus is coming back for a bride, a person who is spotless. They've been purified by the water and by the Spirit. And if you've been coming Sunday nights, you know exactly where I'm headed and keep me from going there because I could be here for a long time. But Jesus said, Unless you are born again of the water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's not a question today to answer, when is Jesus coming back? Unless you're willing to be content with the answer in the fullness of time. And if you're willing to accept that, that there are some things that God knows that I don't have to know, I just need to be ready, then you're ready to move on and say, God, what do I do with my life now? What do I do with my life while I'm waiting? What do I do while I'm here? The disciples had the same situation. What do we do while we're waiting? We know about the manger. We know about the cross. We know about the tomb. We know you're here. What do we do now? Is this the time? He says, it's not the time. But he says this, go to Jerusalem and wait until. What was he telling them? He was saying, listen, I've got something for you to do in the meantime. And you and I are alive in the meantime. This is not the day of your birth and it's not the day of your death. And by the grace of God, you will see 2015. And I pray that the meantime that you live between now and then will be spent in such a way that should the Lord come and knock on your door, should the Lord bring you to his throne and say your time on earth is done, you will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You will not hear, you wicked and slothful servant, be cast out. Because there are only two places that people are going to spend eternity. They will either spend it in the presence of our awesome God, For eternity, no tears, no sadness, no sorrow. Or they will spend it in utter torment. Folks, if you think hell is last week's job, or your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend, your ex-wife or ex-husband, your boss, you haven't even considered what the Bible says hell is. There are some people who are trying to convince people that the worst it's going to get is life on earth. I'm here to tell you the Bible says differently. I'm here to tell you Jesus says that hell is a place of eternal torment. And it's not on earth. You'll either believe what Jesus said or you'll believe what somebody else said. And those disciples had to say, what are we going to believe? Well, good news is this. They chose to believe what Jesus said. 
Jesus raises up, he goes to the heavens, he ascends, and the angels say, what are you all standing here for? Jesus told you what to do. Go to Jerusalem. So what did they do? They went to Jerusalem. Hey, the rest is history. And can I tell you that I'm here because they obeyed? And if you are filled with his spirit today, you are here and where you're at spiritually because those disciples who were so worried about when he's coming back chose to say, you know what? There's some things that are settled in heaven and there's some things I've got to do right now. I don't have time today to walk through chapter 25. But I would challenge you, if you are answering that question, what am I supposed to be doing now? You need to read chapter 25. And if you can't get it all figured out and, and you need some, somebody to walk with you, I'll buy you lunch. We'll talk about it. I'll be more than happy to sit down with you and walk you through what God would have you understand about your life in Christ and what it means. But before we close, before you walk out of here, you need to have a chance. For some of you, you just need to be able to reaffirm, God, it's okay that I don't know when you're coming. It is okay if I don't know that, but it's not okay if I'm not ready.